We're here at the Matterport offices in London, UK. I'm with Mark Cuddy and Keith McMahon. And we've been looking at the Matterport book, which is coming out in summer 2019. Both Mark and Keith have been providing technical support and assistance and have also made contributions to the book. So I'd like to introduce you first, Keith. Hello. So Keith, <laughs> uh, if you can tell us a bit about maybe where you've come from today in terms of where your business is based and a little bit about your business. Yeah, sure. Um, we first stumbled across Matterport cameras uh, about three years ago. Uh, we were looking for a house at the time and we stumbled across the, te the technology and thought what a great way it was of, of showcasing property. So uh, my wife and I, who, who run Venue View, um, we decided to take the plunge. We bought a camera, we imported it to the UK. So this was before Matterport cameras were available in the UK. Um, and we set out to try and crack the residential market. Um, we kind of pivoted quite quickly um, and um, we focused on the, the hospitality sector, um, particularly meetings and events venues, because that's where we saw the, the biggest opportunity to really make the most of the tech. When you say you took the plunge, that sounds like quite a dramatic uh, moment when you made quite a, uh, a swift decision. How much research went into your decision before you went ahead? Uh, probably not enough, if I'm honest, um, given that we both gave up our jobs at the same time. Um, so uh, I was working as an area manager for um, Coral, the, the bookmakers, and uh, my wife was um, uh, a marketing manager. Uh, and we looked at the camera, loved it, both quite techy, um, bought it and uh, proceeded to, to hand in our notices and, uh, and, and get started. So yeah, it really was um, a leap of faith just because we saw this tech and loved it and, and thought that it was a real opportunity to make the most of it. Okay, well, let's just pause your story there for a moment because I'm going to um, go to Mark Cuddy for a moment. Just if we can, if you want to introduce yourself, how you got introduced to the Matterport system and then we'll get into some of the nitty gritty debate. Yeah, so um, I got into Matterport uh, about 14 months ago, 15 months ago. Um, I always worked in IT, uh, always had a strong interest in technology. Um, I described myself as a bit of a geek, um, I, but I decided I didn't want to do the corporate world anymore. Uh, I wanted to go and look for something for myself. And I think I sort of stumbled, stumbled into Matterport, um, saw the technology being used online. It may have even been one of Keith's source. <laughs> ah, so I was going to say, where was the first time? What was the first? I think it was one? probably yeah. one of one of Keith's source. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly which one, um, but it, the, the, the visual context that it gives you of a space, I could just see hundreds of, uh, of applications for it and applications around it. Um, Had you been working in 3D before that? You'd used different cameras or this was really all new to you? No, it was all new. Um, okay. So I'd, I'd, I'd already decided that I wanted to get into um, something that I could, I could do myself. I went on a drone course. Oh. Um, so you I got a drone a, license? I had a week spare and decided I was going to do a drone course. <laughs> um, and there were a lot of people, uh, the market's fairly saturated in terms of creative media in drones. Um, so I was looking for something else with drones that, that I could do. And that's when I started looking at and researching 3D in terms of photogrammetry from, mm. from drones. So how much research, before we get into further discussion, how much research did you do for your business? So. I, th I did a lot of research on the drone side, but like I say, I sort of stumbled onto Matterport. Mm. Um, did you do a Keith and just go out and, <laughs> and, and buy one? I'd already um, taken redundancy from my job by then. So <laughs> yeah, but I, I pretty much did the same thing. I saw it, right. I was wowed by it. Right. Um, people that I showed were wowed by it. Um, I thought there was a market for it. Um, mm -hmm. So I went for it. Well, let's... Let's get into some discussion, um, and thank you to both of you for introducing yourselves. I think, just to start the controversy, business in a box. We, we were talking a little early before we started the podcast, and one of the things I mentioned was, you know, if you're living out in the hills, or if you're up in, you know, I come from Chester, if you're up there, there's going to be a limited market, you know, and, and you buy a Matterport, where does that leave you? And I think Keith's response was, was very interesting at that point, because uh, you had a very different opinion, Keith. Yeah, I think that, that geography, 
doesn't really come into it. Um, what, what's far more important is understanding how business works. Mm. I think you can buy a camera and you can be in Chester, for example, um, but if nobody knows you're in Chester, if nobody knows what you do, and if you've not got a route to market and a way of reaching people, then they're never going to know what you do because they don't ever hear it. Mm. Um, I think that the business in a box thing is something that we've, we've mentioned a few times and it's something that I'm really passionate about because it's easy to buy a product and think that you've bought a business. Mm. You know, it's easy to buy something and think, because I love this, because this is something that I think is amazing, everybody else is gonna love it, and as such, I'm gonna be a, you know, a millionaire on the back of it. And, and it couldn't really be further from the truth, because if you buy a camera, it just sits in the box until you reach the people that are interested in using your services. So, so for me, the business in a box thing is, is, is about if you're gonna buy a camera or if you've got a camera, you need to make sure that you're operating a business in a, a, a traditional way, it may be new and innovative tech, but you still need to do your lead gen, you still need to do your sales, you still need to do your order fulfillment and your invoicing and, and the editing and the customer service. All of that needs to be in there. And you need to have an idea when you set out, it doesn't need to be you know, 100% nailed down, you know, a business plan written to the nth degree, but you need to have an idea about how you're gonna bring in enough business to scale. Well, let me let me stop you there for a second. How did you know? I mean, have you done? Have you any business training before, or did you find your way through from scratch? Because again, you took the the radical decision. You 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 went for it. You you didn't do a huge amount of research, as you say. Mm -hmm. And so, how did you know what to do? So, I think that the, the the difficulty in that is is you have a certain set of skills that you think are going to see you through. So, my background was area management. I was used to looking at P and L. You know, making decisions about which products to push, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you're when you're in that um, big business environment and you're surrounded by all of the different departments, the marketing department, the sales team, you know, the cleaners, you know, everything gets done around you and you just manage it all. The challenge when you step into running your own business is all of a sudden you're responsible for all of these things. And that's where many people um, can find it quite difficult because they've got this camera, but they don't know anything about lead gen. They don't know anything about sales. They don't know anything about creating a website. And when you are faced with all of these things, half the time you don't know where to start. Mm. You know, what do I, you know, I need all of these things. You know, you listen to podcasts or you go to trade shows and people are telling you, you need all of these things, yeah. but where do I actually start? So having an idea and, and speaking to maybe a business advisor about a business that you're going to be creating is important. You know, it may be shiny new tech, but you need to have a, a, a foundation that sits underneath it about running a business. So you went to a business advisor? So yeah, so we've spoken to lots of, lots of people over the last three years. Would I say we've done it all perfectly? Absolutely not. You know, we've gone through typical um, SME um, roller coasters of up and down, up and down. Because when you are a small team, you're driving lots of leads, dealing with all of the sales, and then if there's only a few of you, you're out, you're shooting, you're creating the tours, you're delivering customer service, which means that your sales and lead gen can then take a back seat. So you kind of go up and down and up and down. I think we're in a position now where we're starting to scale and move forward with more members of the team dealing with lead gen and, and sales. Yep. But it's taken us a long time to get there. So I would definitely advise people to be thinking about that right from the start. So a question to you, Mark. Do you think that, I mean, if you go to a sales, if you go to a business advisor, do you think they really can advise on such uh, cutting edge technology such as Matterport. I mean, is it is it not a case of really going out there and understanding? Because you talked about niche before. Um, I think it's what what business advisors bring is is best practice, okay. and, and that's best business practice in all the areas Keith just spoke about. Mm. Um, I, I think there is a pitch to the technology that goes along with that that best business practice. Um, and that pitch that when I started my business, everyone said, wow, everyone that I showed it to said, wow, it's really easy to sell it to the end user. The end user just wants to use it. It's much more difficult to sell it to a business person uh, as a solution to a business problem that they have. So you always have to start with their business problem. And I think what Keith said, uh, when we were talking about niche and we were all talking about it earlier, it, it's understanding, niching down into a particular market vertical or sector, understanding the the business problems, the pain points uh, of of 
customers within that sector and developing your product, your product isn't Matterport. Your product is something that you develop to address their business problems. So what, what did you do personally? I mean, what would you describe your niche as? I, I, I don't think I have niche down yet. So, okay. so I'm more of an experimenter. I use Mar Matterport. I, I try to do things that, that other people don't do or haven't done. Um, so okay, I, such as? Well, so when, when the BLK360 integration came out, uh, I immediately took that very expensive leap. <laughs> um, I, I could see the benefit into the AEC sector. I could see some extra benefits in being able to, to, to scan outdoor spaces. Um, so how, would, how do you use the BLK typically as, a, as part of your toolkit along with, say, the Matterport Pro 2? Well, so I think in the early days, um, we were offering outdoor scans. So a lot of venues in Keith's business have uh, garden areas, um, places that they need to connect to, you know, huge outdoor spaces where they pitch tents for, for weddings, as an example. Uh, and we were offering that as part of the tour. And as a side effect of that, if you like, it sort of introduced the closed dollhouse. So you get a, a Matterport dollhouse view with the exterior view. Mm. of the the property without being able to see into all of the rooms and a lot of the clients that we had at the time really liked that they wanted to be able to show their the exterior of their property in 3d um, just just for anyone that's that's not aware because i know that we talk about these things all the time so a, a, a blk so just a, a kind of overview of what a yeah. blk is for anybody that's not aware uh, so the the matterport pro 2 camera um, which is the camera that you you initially invest in uh, as part of the uh, the SAS package. Um, it, it's a camera, really high resolution camera, but has some limitations in how it captures its 3D data through infrared, um, particularly in bright sunlight. So the sun, the infrared from the sun washes out uh, the infrared that the camera is sending and it therefore can't see any, any data. Uh, the, the BLK360 um, is a Leica entry level laser scanner so it uses lidar which means that sunlight isn't an issue for for it to gather that that 3d data um and it really opened up a, a whole new outdoor world so used in conjunction with the matterport pro 2 it, it, it produced well it took the dollhouse to the next level is what you're saying yeah i, I thought the dollhouses produced by combining them were, were just stunning in some cases Let's talk about the entry level a little bit um, and what we mean by entry level cameras, they've recently been added to the Matterport, or made compatible with Matterport. We're talking about Ricoh Theta uh, V, we're talking about the Insta360 ONE X and potentially other cameras in the pipeline. Um, I know you've been doing some experimentation and one of the reasons you've got involved with the book that, that I'm currently uh, writing is that you've done some of that kind of experimentation yourself. What, what sort of thing have you been up to? Uh, so I've done lots of crazy things. What's uh, the craziest? With those cameras. So I've uh, uh, I've had the camera up on a, a drone um, to take a look at whether we could produce 3D models from the air. Um, okay. How and, did that work out? Uh, mixed. Mixed results. Mixed. So it, it works, mm. but I, I couldn't see an application for it because the, the, mm. you can't collect the 3D data. If you're just looking at a walkthrough uh, from the sky, then, yeah, I think you can do it. Where do you think the entry level in your experience, all your experiments, where do you think entry level really shines? It shines in conjunction with the Pro 2. Okay. Um, so there are things, limitations with the Pro 2 in terms of, of water. I've already mentioned sunlight. Um, because the entry level cameras use structured light to build the 3D model. Um, what do you mean by that? So, so it, it uses the, the photo data. Right. So it gets it analyzes straight edges. It analyzes pieces of the sorry cortex, which is the AI system. Mm. Analyzes straight edges, matches um, patterns within the the normal image. Yes, I think one of the things that Matterport really sell their uh, artificial intelligence, their AI on, is that that it has been taught to recognize objects. So everyday objects, especially in domestic or, or commercial environments, tables, chairs, etc. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, in conjunction, what, what about, um, I, I know in conversation you talked about small spaces, you talked about um, uh, different sort of angles and, and places where the Matterport Pro 2 or other cameras can't go. Yeah. Have you done that sort of thing? Um, so I think my favourite of those is um, a, a model railway. 
Um, so I, I put the um, the Rico Theta V on a, a very small tripod uh, at a model railway um, uh, and tried to tried to produce both a, a sort of drone's eye view and turn the camera upside down and tried to produce a, a street view level view of the, the model railway. Um, and it worked quite well. It worked a lot better than I was expecting considering that the AI is taught to recognize things from a certain level. It works best if, if you're at an average uh, tripod height. Um, so, you know, honestly, the, the doll's houses weren't great, um, but the client that I was looking to do this with wasn't particularly interested in the doll house. Uh, they'd never had any 3D image made because the scale is so small. They'd never had any 360 image made of, of that space. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think when you say that the dollhouse didn't work out as well, um, I mean, you get the most accuracy from the Matterport Pro too, but what you do find in all of the walkthroughs and all of the, the models that are created, uh, and one of the advantages is that the system is placing the scans in the correct places. Yeah. And so I guess that when you're saying that wasn't necessarily, the 3D model wasn't necessarily what you're looking for, Sure. The rest of it's automatically done, the rest of it's yeah. automatically there. So, so Cortex couldn't recognize at those, those very small scales. Uh, it's expecting to see you know, a, a five foot distance to the next scan, uh, and I've got a, a five centimeter mm -hmm. distance to the next scan. It could confuse it slightly. Uh, but in terms of a walkthrough, yeah, it worked. Well, I mean, the interesting, sorry, just going back to sort of uh, the entry level usage. Um, I mean, personally, in my own experiments, I've tried to do stuff that you know, the official line from Matterport is, look, we don't usually recommend outdoor scanning, et cetera. Managed to get it to do a decent job. And I think that's the interesting thing, especially with entry level, is that the the the, the, the cost, the investment um, does encourage experimentation and you can do quite a lot with it. Uh, sorry, I, Keith, I, think, I think it's it's interesting that it's kind of sort of gone back full circle to, to when we were looking at it originally, you know, as as the core usage, mm -hmm. it was in and around uh, residential property, you know, estate agents and the like. Yes. And I think that the, the 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 cortex has a huge, huge volume of data that's been taken from all of the the many, many thousands of of tours that have been captured in residential properties. So I think that's where the, the you'll, you'll get your most accuracy when you're in a, an environment yes. where it's yeah. been you know specifically designed for, and and that's where it goes back full circle because I think that you know whilst you look at the the experimental uses, I think for me one of the core uses for, for that type of technology is in the residential sector mm -hmm. because you know you've got budget to maybe mid-range properties where the agents may not want to invest heavily um, in, in, in you know, somebody to do a Pro 2 scan, but you can have agents that have um, a, a 360 camera in one pocket and their iPhone in another, and they can effectively create a tour you know, out of these two pieces of kit. And that's where the entry level thing, I think, has, has lots of scope to get so many models and really benefit the residential market because you can have agents that, that have the kit on them. So let's get controversial. Do the entry level cameras reduce the need for the Pro 2 camera? In my opinion, no. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because um, you're not gonna have somebody that's just bought an entry level Canon camera that's gonna be competing with a professional photographer. You know, it's a completely different bit of kit, you're getting completely different outputs and they're geared towards a very different customer. You know, you've got people that have got Pro 2s, you've got people such as Mark that have got a BLK, and what they can do with those is phenomenal. You can do lots with the entry level stuff, but it's nowhere near the professional level that you're getting from the Pro 2 and the BLK. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things I've been discussing with people is that kind of appropriate cost for appropriate level of, of quality. And um, when you've used the Rolls Royce of, of you know, the, the, the walkthrough cameras, the Matterport Pro 2, yeah, of course the entry level is not going to be quite the same image quality, but but also the price isn't. And so my question to you would be, do you think that the the pricing of, say, the way that the entry level cameras are priced versus quality, and then you look at the Matterport Pro 2, uh, personally to me it looks like everything seems appropriate to the level it's used uh, at. Does that? How do you feel about that? 
I, I agree with that um, because we work predominantly with um, mid to, to, to luxury end hotels and they want a really high level of quality from the images and the tours. Have you, have you ever had to use an entry level camera in any of those tours in complement to the Matterport Pro 2? I haven't, but I right. can see the applications, you know, like, like um, smaller bathrooms, for example, where yes. you, you've got a smaller space and a camera on a single stand could be used, mm. um, you know, places such as that, you know, places where maybe you've got um, um, objects nearby mm. and you don't want to put a Matterport camera nearby, just, you know, there's, there's lots of potential uses for it mm. if you're using it in conjunction with the Pro 2, but to be fair, because Mark has all three cameras, he's probably a better person to, to answer that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so it is what Keith said. Sometimes you get areas where the, the Pro 2 can't spin in a doorway, especially in hotels where, where you have these space-saving doorways that you can only open at 45 degrees to get into them. Um, so it gives you an extra scan point in, in the doorway. Um, swimming pools, I mentioned. So swimming pools on hotel scans taken with the Pro 2 uh, have up to date been black holes mm. uh, because mm. the IR is, is reflected, it bounces off the water and not in the direction that, that the Matterport needs it. Mm -hmm. Blue swimming pools are now, are now, you know, they're starting to emerge across the MSP <laughs> community right. as the guys realize that they can just go in with a, a Leica or, or an Insta and get that you know that additional depth of quality if you like into their into their dolls houses yeah I, I mean and going back to the book what i've tried to do in the book is give so many different examples of uses from the entry level and then in the uh, the matterport pro 2 and and mark you're contributing to a, a blk uh 360 um, section as well just to show really how these things fit together and how they can be used uh in conjunction um I think even even separately, uh, okay. as Keith was saying, they have markets. Mm -hmm. So so when you look at anything that is volume market driven, you want to be doing it with a, 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 as low a cost as you can. It, it, essentially, you're looking at commodity markets, and there are plenty of those spaces that haven't been explored yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'll give an example of, um, you know, the the five G networks rolling out, um, and the five G network is going to require a lot more infrastructure for mobile telecom providers than they currently have because of the range of the signal. I won't get too geeky. Okay. <laughs> um, but they don't need necessarily the the measurements of a space to to 99.97%. What they want is a visual overview of a space. Imagine you're going out and you have to site survey 25,000 new sites and you're using engineers to go and do that and they're coming back with a, a form with written data on it. Entry level camera provides the engineers that are in you know in the the central office exactly the same thing at a fraction of the cost of half a day of an engineer mm -hmm. uh, but it's a commodity service do you know i i agree with mark on that i think each of the three brackets has a, a huge potential market and whilst there is some overlap I think that you can certainly go after that market with each of those cameras. You know, you've got your entry level, which are, you know, you can work on volume, you can get lots done very quickly. Um, you know, you can do them for a reasonable price. You know, you can do work outside. You know, so there's lots of, of potential yeah. sectors that you could go into. You know, with the Pro 2, you're getting really high quality images. Um, you know, HD quality, you can download the images, really high quality. You can generate floor plans. You've got a really high quality 3D model. You can embed all of your media in there, you know. So, mm -hmm. so again, a market there. And then if you're looking at the top end, the BLK, you know, you've got your super high density point clouds, where, which are really, really accurate that you can mm -hmm. then just plug into to CAD based software and the like. So, really for sort of architects and designers yeah. and things such as that. So, there's, there's, there are some very distinct markets when you look at the three. And I think that, you know, a, a smart business person that was going after the right set to the right niche could use the appropriate product to reach the, the right customers. So let's go back to the book for a second. Uh, personally, and again with your help, I've been trying to encapsulate many of these discussions and just show examples. Because I mean, the idea is it's really a coffee table book that you can pick up, but you can also learn a lot from as well. And what I've tried to do is interview um, relevant people who can contribute in terms of how they develop their business, even people at you know high up in Matterport, RJ Pittman, uh, David Gausbeck, Ch Chief Technology Officer. Um, what do you personally, just talking about the book and the book launch, what personally 
did would you want when you were first told about the book what do you want from this type of book and from what you've seen do you think it delivers yeah so um i guess if i was starting out in matterport uh, or i was looking to make a decision on whether to to invest in matterport i i would be looking for um some business examples examples of, of partners that have, have been through the process uh, i would be looking for tips and tricks i would be looking for examples of, of how to use the technology i think it delivers all of those uh, as a more experienced matterport user uh, i think it's still very useful um, I, I think during our conversations we've sort of uh, started on one point and mm -hmm. and moved to something completely different that you know either keith or i has gone really we can do that <laughs> um, so yeah i think it's useful across the board Okay. And I think that um, for me, one of the great things is that this is a, a very visual product. You know, the whole sort of Matterport range and everything it does is all about the visuals. So it's great that it's being presented in this format, you know, with lots of images in there, mm -hmm. you know, lots of things for people to leave through and look. And, and, and I agree with Mark, you know, as we've been going through this, I've learned things as yeah. well. And yeah. particularly some of the interviews with um, some of the support teams and, you know, some of those making the decisions about the direction of the company, etc. You know, there's lots of information there that, that I found really valuable. Okay. Well... It's, and it's certainly appreciated that you've contributed to that. I think what I'd like to do is, is draw this to a close, but just finally, get a, just ask you a couple of questions um, with regard to your own companies, really. Where you see each of your companies in, say, five years, ten years, where will Matterport be in your company? How will you be using it in the next few years? Well, uh, in actual fact, I think there's three answers to that. Uh, there, there is one for me and, and what we're doing at Venue View. There's probably one for Mark, you know, and what he's doing at C3D. Mm. And then there's a, a joint venture that we're working on between us. All right, what's um, that? So, so that's um, a platform called Virtual Wedding Venues. Um, and it's a platform where um, service partners or, or venues can put their tours. Um, because if you look out there in the wider market, particularly for hotels and venues, there's probably... Um, a lack of opportunities to really showcase your tour to a, a, a large marketplace. Um, so we're providing a way for them to do that. We're putting their tours on a portal as well as booking links and you know and, and ways of people for people to get in touch. Uh, and that's a, a joint venture between the two of us. Something that we're really excited about because we want MSPs to have another. Uh, another place for, for, for their customers to put their tours, you know, get themselves out there and, and show what they're doing. So that's a, a yeah. joint. Have you got a website for that? HCTPS virtual wedding menus .com. And Just to add to what Keith said, we're, we're not just going to give them a place to, to put their tours. We're going to offer packages where they can enhance their tours uh, with different features, uh, where we can add marketing tools around the tour. Um, so building a platform where the, if I was in a restaurant, the tour is the steak, uh, and we're building recipes around that steak to make a meal. <laughs> okay. And um, yeah, your C3D? So C3D, I think, is, is going to be, uh, it's going to try and continue to be experimental. When I look at this technology, uh, and not just Matterport, in terms of the hardware and the cameras uh, that are coming out, um, it, it's difficult to see where we're going to be in five years, because the hardware is going to change so much in three, uh, and the platforms that are available, uh, it'll just be unrecognizable. I think I think you can have a five-year business plan, but your your technology plan needs to be sort of twelve months yes. by twelve mm -hmm. months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from a, a venue view perspective, where you know we're going to continue concentrating on the hospitality sector, um, you know hotels, venues, um, and getting more shooters out there. Um, I think as we as time goes by, we start to refine our offer in that. We started off when we very, very, and this is a great um, tip for anybody that's just starting out. When we first started out promoting our services, we talked all about the the features of the tour. We talked about the doll's house model. We talked about the HD walkthrough. You know, we talked about this, that, and the other. And whilst all were great, didn't actually mean much to our end user. You know, so now all of our terminology is about the value that we add to customers. 
you know, by you know, putting uh, direct booking links inside your tour, by showing the same room in multiple different layouts, you know, by generating you more direct business. All of that is the value that we're providing to our hospitality-based clients, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to scale it up as time goes by. But whatever niche people are looking at uh, working in, um, really talk about what you're adding to, to, to that niche and what problem you're solving for your customers rather than just talking about the bells and whistles. So it seems that there's almost a, you need almost a mentality of uh, looking at the Matterport tour as the kind of initial hook, but it's really not the end in itself. It's a, it's a case of what do you do with it that kind of really provides the solid information within that. So you can impress people. All you're doing is keeping people on there interested and amazed by the technology whilst you're feeding them information that could, could bring long-term value and information uh, with regard to the product or service or, or location. Yeah, it's, it's not necessarily about what it does, it's about what problem it solves for the person. Yeah. And if you can convey that, then you're halfway there. Let's just ask one final question. What's your favourite function of uh, Matterport? What do you like using the most? I know, Keith, you've talked about Matter Tags. Yeah, so, so I love the Matter Tags. I think they're, they're a, a great way of embedding media. You can put video in tours, mm. images, direct booking links. Um, we had a situation last week where you know a, a spa was on a, a lower level. There were no stairs. So we had to uh, create a way of, of in, inserting a lift button. So people press the lift button and they go down to the floor below. So, so yeah, the matter text can be used hugely um, in, in all sectors. Um, so I would say that they're, they're my personal favorite. And, and that's in the book, by the way. I just like to promote that again. <laughs> so Mark, what's your favorite functionality? So I think my, my favorite um, actually comes out of uh, the, the, the Matterport ecosystem rather than Matterport themselves. So Matterport have delivered a great core product, yeah. um, but I think Chris Hickman with NPM Bed um, has provided Matterport users with, with some really amazing functionality uh, so additional outside tools. of the core. Mm. Additional yeah. tools, yeah. Um, so uh, the ability to have text-to-speech text on a, a scan point so right. that as somebody enters a room they can get an audio description from uh, of what that room is and is for and and, and that's called npm bed npm bed okay https npmbed.com all right just to fully promote that <laughs> um, but i'd like to leave it there but thank you very much mark and keith uh, for coming in and um as a, as we previously mentioned matterport 3d capture for all book will be available in summer 2019 um mark if you just briefly wanted to give your website one final time yeah, it's c3d.space. C3d.space. Yeah, that's the word space, not the bar space. Okay. <laughs> and Keith? Ours is venueview.co.uk. Uh, and of course, that combined one is um, virtualweddingvenues.co.uk. Ah, it's not. It's not. It's virtualweddingvenues.com. Okay, dot com, remember that. And my own website is www.simco, that's S I M C O E, dot co.uk. And thank you very much for coming in and I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast.